The Essenes have an aura of profound mystery about them. Becoming perfect light humans is clearly the goal of the Essenes. They knew mystical secrets, and these secrets had to do with human transformation into celestial beings and ascension. Why were they called Essenes? A name awarded them doubtless in recognition of their holiness. Holiness means to be luminous, radiant, and angelic. From this investigation, we will piece together the Ascension teachings and disclosure of extraterrestrial beings left for us by the Essenes, just in time for the arrival of the new humanity in the modern Ascension and Disclosure movement. I'm William Henry, and this is Ascension Keepers. Hello friends, Greg Braden here. Welcome to this edition of Science, Policy and Politics. I'm going to address in this edition a question that uh, came to my office recently. It was a question about something very specific. I'm going to take that question and, and address uh, an even broader topic that, uh, that is relative to this question. The question is from Elle. Elle, I'm going to, for your privacy, I won't share your last name. But her name is Elle, and the question is this. She's saying, would it be possible for Greg to post the CO2 chart uh, or to show a link to the chart that he used in a, an earlier presentation? So she's referring to another YouTube video that I did uh, right at the, the beginning of the year when I was talking about carbon dioxide levels on Earth from a geologic perspective and what that means to us today uh, she's asking about a single chart. There are many, many, many charts that are out there, and I'm going to share a few of them with you today. But let me let me just share why I think this is so important. This is early first quarter 2023, February 23. We are now finished with the Davos meetings in Switzerland. New proposals are coming out from that meeting, being focused through the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, the UN SDG 2030 Sustainable Development Goals that are, uh, the goal is to implement those by the year 2030 uh, through the United Nations. And many of these goals are linked to climate. And the thinking is that the CO2 levels on earth are dangerously high, so that we need to change the way that we live our lives. We need to change our energy sources. We need to change our agricultural sources. We need to change economies and finance in short, turn people's lives upside down in order to accommodate the perceptions that the CO2 levels are, are dangerously high. The people that suffer the most from these kinds of changes are the people in the economic brackets that can least afford the magnitude of change we're being asked to make. They have the least bandwidth. They don't have the buffer to go through these kinds of changes where the shifts in the energy will force people to lose their jobs. And yes, it's possible to retrain in new industries, but you and I know a lot of people, that's not gonna work. Yes, we need to stop burning fossil fuels. And I wholly agree with that. And that has been the point for much of my adult life, my adult career. I am a geologist by degree and I've been sharing and many geologists have since the 1970s that we are in a cycle of climate change. The earth is warming, uh, not because of fossil fuels, but the earth is warming and we need to accommodate that warming in the, the way that we live our lives and the industries and uh, how we live uh, geographically. We need to accommodate that climate change. And we do need to stop burning fossil fuels, not because they're bad, but because they are precious, they are finite, and we need them in so many other areas of our lives 
we need to preserve the fossil fuels. We use petroleum products typically on a typical day, over 6,000 places in our everyday lives, many of them that you'd never even think about uh, are, are dependent upon fossil fuels that go beyond the burning of fossil fuels for fuel for our automobiles and transportation and, and things like that. So we need to stop burning it because we need it for other things. And when it is gone, one of the interesting things in modern chemistry is that oil is one of the few products that we cannot duplicate uh, efficiently the way that it comes out of the ground. So it's not like when the oil is gone, we just make oil in the laboratory so that we can continue you know, using petroleum-based products. I mean, just for example, we would not be having this conversation if it were not for the oil that produced the cases of the computer that you are seeing me in right now, or the mobile phone, or the iPad, uh, and the wires and the cables and the insulation, our clothing, where our food comes from, how the water is pulled from the ground to create the food. Yes, it's possible to do all these through alternatives in some places. On the scale that we are living our lives today, it's not practical to do that. So we're being asked to make tremendous changes in our lives, not just in America, on the planet. Those changes are being recommended through tech companies and through, um, through people who have placed themselves in a position through organizations like the World Economic Forum, like the United Nations, that believe that they are, and many of them, honest, I've met some of these people, they honestly believe that they are, are recommending things that are, are really going to be good for us in, in the long term. It's all based, it's all predicated on what they have been told about carbon dioxide in our planet. Well, I'm a geologist and I wanna to talk to you about carbon dioxide. Uh, and I'm not saying these changes are bad necessarily, but what I'm saying is they're gonna cause a lot of suffering and a lot of people, as, as I mentioned, that can least afford it. And we're being asked to make the changes for reasons that may not be supported by the data. So maybe there are other reasons and that would be another video. But if we're talking about carbon dioxide being dangerous for our planet, and we're talking about high levels of carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide being dangerous for life on our planet, I'm gonna tell you the evidence simply does not support that. Here's what I mean. I'm going to begin with a quote. It comes directly from a government website, www.climate.gov, June of 2022. It's a statement. And it says, quote, carbon dioxide levels today are higher than any point in human history, end of quote. What does that really mean? How long have we been measuring carbon dioxide levels directly? Uh, how far back does human history go? Human history is not earth history, it's not geologic history. If those levels are higher than at any point in human history, is that a bad thing? They're not addressing that. Is it a bad thing that the carbon dioxide levels are higher? We're being led to fear and demonize carbon dioxide, and we're being given quotes like this and slides, I'm going to show you in just a moment, uh, that make it appear that the levels of carbon dioxide are alarmingly high. I'm gonna offer you a little bit different perspective. I want you to have the full story. You can make up your own mind. You can see where this information is coming from and you can see the role, how it's being used uh, in our lives today to direct us to make choices. And the question is who is benefiting from those choices? And you may be surprised at where we go with this. So let's take a look at this. It is, it's all about perspective. Uh, carbon dioxide levels, are they higher? than they've been at any point in human history. Well, first of all, how long have we been measuring carbon dioxide levels directly? The truth is not that long. Direct CO2 measurements only began about 65 years ago. Uh, actually, it was July through December, July 1957 through December of 1958, there was something that was called the International Geophysical Year or the IGY for short. And I remember this when I was a kid, it was a big deal. Everybody was talking about this uh, because it was the first time that the, the nations of the earth had actually come together on a scientific level and said, hey, 
you know, we need to start checking this stuff out. We need to track magnetic fields of the planet, CO2 levels of the planet, ozone levels of the planet, find out what's going on. So we humans, we showed up 200,000 years ago. We began direct measurements about 65 years ago. So let's, let's see what this means. What we're looking at right now, <clears throat> this is a very famous chart. It comes from NOAA, National Oceanographic Atmospheric Administration and um, uh, Scripps Oceanography. All right, so you're looking on the lower left-hand side of the screen. You see the year 1960, but the chart begins a little bit before that. So that's the, the 50, 58, 59, and it ends uh, 2021, just past uh, the 2020 you see. These are carbon dioxide levels that are measured uh, at the observatory in Hawaii, and they are definitely higher. And you can see that the CO2 levels are higher now than they've been since we have been measuring them. That is an absolute fact. Uh, and you can see it very, very clearly on this chart. Now, if we go back into geologic time, uh, are they higher than they have ever been? Well, what you're looking at here, we're seeing uh, the blue are CO2 levels. And what you're seeing, actually, this chart is obsolete now because the CO2 levels are at about 417 ppm, parts per million. So a little above where that arrow is on, on the right-hand side. The blue lines that you see are coming from Antarctica, from ice cores in Antarctica. And they are definitely higher than they've been in the last 800,000 years. That's absolutely true. So what we have to say, lower right-hand corner is present day. All right, 200,000 years ago is where you see the green. So the statement that CO2 levels are higher than they've been in human history is absolutely true. In the last 200,000 years, according to these, uh, these readings, we've never seen CO2 levels this high. How do we know that? Well, a lot of that comes from the ice cores in places that are taken from places like Greenland and Antarctica. Uh, some of you've heard me speak about this before, some never have, so I'm gonna do this very quickly. What you're seeing on the screen is an ice core. This is what they look like. I remember the first time I saw one, they were, they were bigger. They were a thicker diameter than, than I thought they would be. What can you tell from ice? Well, you can tell all kinds of stuff from the ice cores. From those ice cores, we can tell how high or how low the ancient carbon dioxide levels were. And, and let me just explain how this happens, because people say, how can you get that from ice? Well, every year, a layer of ice is deposited in Greenland and uh, the poles, Greenland and Antarctica. And in that ice, there are captured little bubbles of the, the air in the atmosphere at that point in time. So when that air is, is captured and then it's frozen, it becomes a, a permanent record in the ice. The next year, another layer on top of that. Next year, another layer on top of that. So you've got oxygen levels. You've got carbon dioxide levels. You've got methane levels. All of that you can tell from, from the ice. Ancient temperatures, we can tell from the ice by the kinds of animals that we find frozen in the ice, for example. Uh, and especially in seafloor sediments, you can see this as well. Some there are some forms of life that will create a shell that winds in, in one direction clockwise when the temperatures are warmer, counterclockwise, and temperatures are cooler. So we can tell things like that. You can tell the strength of the sun. You can tell about the magnetic fields of the earth. All kinds of things can be uh, derived and extrapolated from the ice cores. So, so this is why they're important. This is what an ice core looks like. Now, if you look up close at an ice core, you can see these striations. Each of those striations is one year of the history of the Earth. So when they go down, uh, you know, 400,000 years ago, we're looking at 400,000 layers that you can read like you can read the pages of a book. You know, the darker layers are picking up volcanic dust that's in the atmosphere or dust from uh, wind storms. Uh, depending on where the wind currents are, pollen grains, all kinds of things like that. So, so the ice is important. The ice is stored in a library, and you're actually looking at one of the ice core libraries where scientists will go in, they'll check out an ice core like you check out a book. And in refrigerated conditions, they'll pull the core from that tube, and they're able to examine it for the year that they're, that they're looking for. So there are a number of different ice core libraries.
So I just want to give you a sense of, of where this information is coming from. Now, let's look at geologic history, not human history. In geologic history, if you look on the right hand side of the screen is present day. The black line that you're seeing and then the shading around it uh, is the carbon dioxide, represents carbon dioxide levels over time. And what you're seeing is we're actually at a relatively low point in the carbon dioxide readings for our planet. Now, are they high from 1958 to 2021? Absolutely. Are they high for the last 800,000 years? Absolutely. In geologic time, it's not really even a drop in the bucket. We're, we're looking at human time in terms of those CO2 levels, but I wanna show you in geologic time, and I wanna show you what was happening on the earth during times in history when the CO2 levels were much higher than they are today. So what you're seeing uh, right now, the blue line that you see is what's called pre-industrial CO2 level. So before we had massive amounts of industry kicking CO2 and fossil fuels burned for fuel kicking CO2 into the air, that's the level. 2021 is the red, that's about 417 parts per million is what you're seeing right there. But if you look at CO2 throughout history, much of Earth's history, the level has been a lot higher than it is today. So I'm saying this because we're being led to believe that we are forcing the CO2 levels higher than they've ever been on the planet and that we're wrecking the planet. And you hear people that are not informed, you hear even media people, you hear this on uh, legacy media, you know, mainstream news talking about this. I want you to see it's not true. Much of the, and especially the familiar periods of time, like the Cretaceous, like the Jurassic, like the Triassic, uh, even like the, the Permian, and we go back even into the Devonian periods, uh, the CO2 levels are much higher than they are today. Now, what does that mean? And you can see on the, the green, I uh, drew a green bar uh, just above, if you see the purple where it says Triassic, and you look directly above that, early Triassic, we're looking at over 1,600 parts per million, not the 417 that we have today. We certainly had a lot of life in the Triassic, but let me show you, let me show you what this looks like. So the little green bar that you're seeing on the left, this is 200,000 years ago. This is when humans appeared on earth. And, uh, and what we're seeing is there has been a steady decline in this overall CO2 levels uh, on a planetary level. Now, this is another chart. This is really interesting because we're being told that CO2 is driving temperature. It can, it doesn't have to, and it doesn't always drive temperature. What you're seeing are places in the past, so the, the average global temperature is in blue, and you're seeing places in the blue where the temperatures are high, although the CO2 levels are low. You're also seeing places where the temperature is high. Look at Jurassic, and you're seeing the blue uh, where the temperatures are elevated, and you're seeing the CO2 levels are elevated as well. The point is CO2 and temperature are not always correlated. That is problematic for the narrative for those trying to make the case that CO2 is driving the temperature increases that we see today. I've got uh, other videos out there. I don't wanna to be too redundant, but other videos showing that the temperatures actually rise before the CO2. And there's a lag time. The temperatures rise first, then the CO2 levels rise. And there are feedback loops coming from the ocean that contribute to this. So when the temperature levels begin to rise uh, because of Earth location in space, for example, the Milankovic cycles, where Earth uh, does a tilt, an angle, and, and a wobble, three different motions as Earth rotates around the sun. Each of those motions uh, has a relationship between the temperature of our planet and where we are located in relationship to the sun. So when the planet begins to warm because of those, sea, sea temperatures begin to increase. Warm water holds less carbon dioxide than cold water. So when Earth begins to rise, yes, you will or warm, you will see a rise in the CO2 levels because the oceans are warming and, and cannot hold that CO2, that's one of the feedback loops. So what you're seeing on this chart, for example, if you look at um, 
look at the Triassic in the orange, and you look at the Jurassic in the orange, there was a plateau of temperatures, although the CO2 levels were low. And then the CO2 levels began to rise in the late Jurassic. And look at what happened. The temperature it actually dropped in the presence of rising temperatures. That doesn't fit the narrative, so it's inconvenient. Uh, look at the Cretaceous, where the temperatures were higher and the CO2 levels continued to drop. So I, I just want you to see that uh, can CO2 drive temperatures warmer? It can absolutely contribute, but it is not the only driver of temperatures. And we're being told that it is and that high CO2 levels are dangerous for us. Now, what does this mean? I want to show you, I'm going to go back in geologic time and look at the marker uh, of the CO, uh, of what was happening, what the CO2 levels were, what the average temperatures were, and, and what was happening on life. So the marker is the Triassic period. Then let's just, I'm going to go back one more slide. If you look at the three, the three uh, periods that you're seeing there, Triassic, Jurassic, Cretaceous, uh, they're all right there in the orange. So you know what we're talking about. So so what was happening to life on Earth during those times? Well, in the Triassic, CO2 levels were high, and no doubt about it, 2,000 parts per million uh, average. There were some that were higher, some that were lower. What was the temperature on Earth? It was warm. Nothing uh, that we'd necessarily want today. The average global temperature, uh, the low was 122, and the high was 140 Fahrenheit, 50 to 60 uh, Celsius. Temperatures were much warmer. Is that a killer for, for life? Well, there was a lot of life happening on Earth during this time. Uh, forests were green and abundant. Those are probably higher temperatures than we'd want today. Let's look at Jurassic. Jurassic is probably one of the best known periods in geologic history because of the movies called Jurassic Park. They were all based on wildlife that was cloned from DNA uh, that was retrieved from Jurassic samples, Jurassic age samples. So during the Jurassic, temp uh, CO2 levels were about half of what they were in the Triassic. They were a thousand parts per million. What were the temperatures? Not too bad, actually. Highs of 80.6 Fahrenheit, average global temperature. Doesn't mean it was that everywhere. There are places where it was lower, places where it was higher. 59 Fahrenheit was the, the average low. So this is very conducive to life with CO2 levels of 1,000 parts per million. Cretaceous, we talked about earlier, we're back up to 2,000 parts per million. And again, we're looking during this time, 82 Fahrenheit was the high 52 low average during this period of time. Those little asterisks, I, I put those there because it was during Jurassic and Cretaceous, there was tremendous greening of the earth forests became dense and abundant and spread on the earth. Uh, and there was abundant land and sea life that was emerging at this time. So I'm saying this because we're being led to believe that high levels of CO2 are going to kill everything. And that simply is not true in the geologic past. Now, I'll tell you where it is a problem when we get to the end of, of this conversation. But I just want to share this with you. The United Nations and the World Economic Forum have a, a working relationship. I, I should have turned these around and said the World Economic Forum and the United Nations. Uh, here's what that relationship is. In 2019, the World Economic Forum signed a, a formalized an agreement. They signed the document uh, formalizing a relationship between the World Economic Forum and the United Nations that the UN would help to implement many of the goals of the World Economic Forum through the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals that are to be implemented uh, between now and the year 2030, UN SDG 2030. So there's uh, a lot of people don't understand that this relationship is there. And this is why the Davos meetings are important, because the visions that emerge from those meetings now have a way to be implemented through the UN and the SDG 2030s. So what are those goals? Well, both the UN and World Economic Forum, uh, they agree that the, the carbon dioxide level right now is as of 2021, these are the latest readings, uh, about 414.7 parts per million. So they're in agreement with that. 
they're in agreement when they look back the year 2010 that the CO2 levels were 390.1 parts per million. Now, why did I choose the year 2010? Well, because the WEF and the UN proposals are looking at backing off from the 2010 CO2 levels by different percentages. They're using 2010 as, as the baseline. The goal is a 45% reduction from 2010 CO2 levels. So this is the goal, stated goal of the UN and the, the WEF. What would that look like? If we took 45% of what the CO2 levels were in 2010, so 390.1 parts per million, the CO2 target then is 214.5 parts per million. So just to be clear, this is the stated goal of the World Economic Forum and the UN. They want 45% reduction from the 2010 CO2 levels. Is that a good thing? Well, what does that mean? Let's take a look at this. If we were to take our CO2 levels back to 214.5 parts per, mi <clears throat> per million, excuse me, when was the last time we saw anything in the neighborhood of those kinds of readings? What kind of a world would we have? Well, we haven't seen it recently, 214.5 parts per million. We haven't seen that recently. Here is a peer-reviewed science article. It's from the journal Nature Communications, 2019. The title of the article, Low CO2 Levels of the Entire Pleistocene Epoch. That's the, the, the title of this peer-reviewed article. What does it mean? If we were to go back, if we were to achieve the goals that the UN and the World Economic Forum propose we would be creating the CO2 levels that we last saw during the Pleistocene epoch on Earth. This is a direct quote. The study shows that for the entire 2.5 million years of the Pleistocene era, carbon dioxide concentrations averaged 250 parts per million. I want to tell you this is low. 250 parts per million is very, very low for our planet. What were the conditions like on our planet? Well, let me show you, first of all, where is uh, Pleistocene? And, and I, I put this up here, and you heard me uh, hesitate here, because they're calling it the Pleistocene era in this article. But what you see on the right-hand column uh, of the chart you're seeing on the screen, it lists the epochs. So geologic time is broken down into periods of time. So you're seeing large periods of time that are called eons. You see on the left column here uh, on your screen. And then the eons were broken into smaller units called eras. Uh, and then the eras were broken into periods. And you see familiar periods, the Cambrian period, the Or Ordovician period, uh, Jurassic, Triassic, Permian, Cretaceous, these are all periods. Then the periods are broken into smaller periods of time that are called epochs. So the Pleistocene and the Holocene, we're in the Holocene, the most recent right now, before us, present time was the Pleistocene. It is actually a, a geologic epoch by some definitions. And you know there are different cutoffs and different ways of, of looking at these. But I wanna give you a sense of where we are. So we're talking about Pleistocene uh, this is where it is in geologic history. So it's way after Cretaceous and Jurassic and Triassic and, and all of that. What was the Pleistocene like? How's it compared to today? Well, let's take a look at this. The average CO2 during the Pleistocene period and the average temperature, how much ice was on the earth and what was life like? These are the markers we're going to look at, all right, and compare them to today. So the average CO2 levels during the Pleistocene, 250 parts per million, as, as we just said in, in the paper. The average today is 417 parts per million. So you can see we're talking about way less CO2. What were the temperatures on Earth like during the Pleistocene? Well, the average global temperature high was 46 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, 7.8 Celsius. Today, those temperatures are 57 Fahrenheit, 
13.89, so 13.9 Celsius, rounding up. So we're looking at a way cooler Earth. The average global temperature, there's a big difference between today's 57 and the 46 that they're talking about here. So cool that it supported ice, a lot of ice during this time, during uh, periods when much, much more of the Earth was covered in ice. How much more? Well, let's take a look at this. During the Pleistocene, about 8%, approximately 8% of the entire Earth, so this includes ocean and land, was covered in ice. 25% of the land, approximately a quarter of the land, was covered in ice. What does that look like today? Well, today, only about 11% of the land is covered in ice and only 3% of the Earth. So you can see that the lower CO2 levels during the Pleistocene were supporting much cooler temperatures uh, and contributing to way more ice on the planet that we're, than we're seeing today. And that ice was actually occurring in parts of the earth that are very populated, Northern Europe and Northern uh, parts of, of North America, you know, down into, into the US, into the uh, North central parts of, of US, certainly the New England states. What was life like? What does that mean? Well, during the Pleistocene, because those CO2 levels dropped, carbon dioxide is what feeds the forests. Plants live on carbon dioxide and they excrete, or it's a respiration, they exhale oxygen. We breathe oxygen, we exhale CO2. So it's a beautiful symbiotic relationship. Because there was less CO2, there was less nourishment for the forests. And during the, um, the Pleistocene, we saw the extinction of forests and of large mammals. Scientists estimate about 32 species of large mammals disappeared in the 2000 years uh, during that Pleistocene epoch. What scientists now say, and this is NASA saying this, because our CO2 levels are higher, Earth is greener now than it has been in the last 20 years. CO2 levels are increasing higher than they were 20 years ago. And the Earth is actually greener than it is right now. So the Pleistocene conditions if we were to go back to Pleistocene conditions, it creates an Earth very, very different than we have today, much cooler uh, in terms of temperature, much lower levels of carbon dioxide, much less green plant life, and possibly extinction level uh, for, for mammals. That's what happened in the Pleistocene. So the question is, who benefits from those conditions? Who benefits? from an earth that looks like it looked during the Pleistocene. Uh, one of the interesting facts uh, that I wanna mention here is that the Pleistocene epoch, it, it covers that 200,000 year point before present when we emerged. We actually appeared, humans, anatomically modern humans, we emerged on the earth 200,000 years ago during these conditions. And, and these are the conditions we learned to live in, but the conditions continued to improve as the CO2 levels became higher and the earth became greener uh, over time and the earth warmed. So this is very interesting because the science also tells us <clears throat> that when we emerged, we did not emerge as a result of the evolutionary processes that were taught when I was in school in the 1950s, 60s, and early 70s. I was taught that we are the product of random mutations and lucky biology. This is Darwin's theory. I'm a geologist. I support Darwin's theory for many forms of life. We see evolution for plants, animals, and insects. You see it in the fossil record. Can't deny that. However, something happened 200,000 years ago, and Darwin's theory of evolution cannot account for us, for the emergence of anatomically modern humans relatively quickly. And we know this because the fossilized DNA that we're now able to, to retrieve, it used to be science fiction that we could do that. That's Jurassic Park. We now it's, can do this as science fact. 
Uh, and again, I'm hesitating because I've covered this in so many other videos. I don't want to be too redundant here. But the, the DNA evidence says that we're the product of a series of, of genetic fusions between chromosomes and mutations of genes that cannot be attributed to natural forces and natural factors. And that's where science stops. Science says what it's not. Science cannot tell us why these things happened. So we know that human chromosome two is a result, for example, it's a fusion of two pre-existing chromosomes. We know this because of, of the location of the telomeres in the middle of the, the chromosome. We know chromosome seven had genetic mutations that allow us complex speech, allow us to sing. We know that after chromosome two was fused, there were genes that were silenced, genes that were added, genes that were taken away to stabilize that fusion. They all happened in a very brief period of time, not slowly gradually over a long period of time. They all happened at the same time, 200,000 years ago when we emerged. Uh, this is not Darwin's idea of evolution. Something else happened. It happened 200,000 years ago during the Pleistocene, during the time when if we were to achieve the goals set by the WEF and the UN, that would place us back into that period of time. So the question is who or what benefits from these conditions? The answer is it's not us today. And we have to start asking the question, if not us, then who? Who benefits from these conditions? Uh, There's so many factors that come into this that could be their own video. And I, I do, I talk about this and I will continue in, in other videos. When you look at all of the other conditions that are happening in the world today, the fact that the fertility rate is dropping dangerously fast, I talk about that in another video, uh, the talk that we will not overpopulate the earth, we will reach peak, peak population at about 10 billion around 2040, and unless something changes, life on earth, human life is dropping dangerously quickly, we're going to have uh, actually a, a population problem in terms of too few humans rather than too many. Uh, why are we being groomed? Why is the earth being groomed for conditions that so closely match the Pleistocene 200,000 years ago? Uh, that's the question that we need to ask. The higher CO2 levels that are happening today, are they contributing to the warming? They may be. Is that warming dangerous to life on Earth? Geologic history tells us it's not, and we're nowhere near those CO2 levels that, that had dangerously high temperatures. What it does is it makes life difficult for people who have chosen to live, you know, a matter of feet from the edge of the ocean. Will ocean levels rise? They will rise if the temperatures are rising, as they have in the past. The only life that it's bad for is people who have chosen to build in floodplains and people that have chosen to build dangerously close to the, to the coastal areas. So if we allow for the rhythms and cycles of our planet, we would know that we need to change the way we think and the way we live in society and the way that we build architecturally to accommodate those cycles. We haven't done that. So now what we're trying to do is force nature to accommodate our choices of lifestyles uh, so that we're not inconvenienced by this. And this is where the rubber meets the road in terms of science. Uh, you know, why aren't we allowing for the conditions, the cyclic conditions that we see in geologic history the rhythms that are causing a, a slight warming that we have right now, why aren't we allowing for those conditions and building to adapt and accommodate them rather than the arrogance of thinking that we need to change these CO2 levels on the planet to go back to where they were 200,000 years ago when we emerged? It doesn't make sense. And when something doesn't make sense, it's generally because, uh, because we don't have all the information. And I'm not saying that I do. I have my own personal feelings about why we're being driven back and who this benefits. But I'm going to tell you right now, it's not the people of this earth that are benefiting from this. 
So with that, I'm going to close this part of this presentation. I have other presentations are going to pick up where I leave off. I'm going to leave off here in the interest of time. Uh, I want you to ask yourself these questions. I want to see your comments, how you feel about the information. Have I missed something in the geologic history, you geologists out there? Uh, and if I'm not, who do you think benefits? Like I said, I, I have my own personal feelings and I will talk about those and I have in other YouTube videos on this channel. You'll see exactly what that's all about. I'm not gonna cover it on, on this, uh, this one right now uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, and part of those is the length of time. Part of those is I wanna see what your thoughts are on this. So let me know how you feel about this information. Thank you for allowing me to share this with you today. And uh, I'm really interested to see where we go with this conversation. All right, thanks so much. Take good care. I look forward to our next.